Nurses in Training, a Romance by Chris Davies Curtis. Chapter 1. Tina took the young student nurse's hand and pressed it hard on the dressing before concentrating on the instrument trolley by her side. Press as hard as you can, nurse, to stop the bleeding, while I prepare the sutures. The jagged wound still pumped blood through the girl's fingers and dripped on the floor. At the sound of a gasp, Tina turned in time to see the young girl's face blanch. Here, let me do that. Go and see if you can find the doctor. And you'd better get a breath of fresh air. After nearly three years' training, Tina had become inured at all the sights and emergencies she had experienced. She had nearly forgotten how it felt to be a new trainee. With a flash, a memory of her first day returned, and she remembered how she had watched the tiny motes of dust spiralling in a shaft of weak February sunlight. It shone into the dark chapel like a ray of hope for the future. She remembered the moving words read by the matron, and had joined the eighty other student nurses in reading the Nightingale Pledge. Her heart had swelled with pride and some apprehension. This was it. She was a trainee nurse in a large English hospital. It was 1958, and she was just 18 years old. Tina glanced at the girl next to her. Dark eyes flashed in the sunlight, reflecting it like jet beads, and the expressionless honey-brown face showed no emotion. The girl's black hair was scraped under her stiff white starched cap, and the soft-fitted collar looked tight on her slim neck. Her light brown skin showed off the butter-yellow uniform dress and dark blue cape, with just a peep of the red lining in sight, and the red ties crisscrossed her chest tightly. Looking around at the rows of identically dressed girls, Tina stifled a grin. "'We all look like soldiers going into battle,' she muttered. But her neighbour either did not hear or chose to ignore her. Feeling a little rebuffed, Tina tried again to make friends. She was at the same time lonely but excited at the prospect of meeting new people, though she was not sure about sharing a room with strangers. As an only child, she had never had to do that before. "'I wonder what happens now,' she whispered to her neighbour. "'Well, if you had listened instead of chattering, you would have heard the matron telling us to go to the classroom.' She moved away and was soon swept up by the other nurses surging towards the exit doors. "'Thanks a bunch.' Tina felt that was not such a good start, but walked out with the others along the green and cream corridors and across a courtyard to the preliminary training school building. The sun had disappeared behind billowing clouds, and a cold wind whipped little pieces of rubbish and old dried autumnal leaves around her ankles. She was glad of the laced brown shoes and thick black stockings as she wrapped her wool cloak around her shoulders. Suddenly a stronger gust threatened to dislodge her cap, and strands of her unruly auburn hair sprang from the pinned back of the cap, and she nearly knocked her glasses off as she grabbed for it. Her cloak flew open and flapped around her in the unflattering uniform. Giggling, the girls tumbled into the training school, to be brought up sharply by a command from the diminutive figure in grey just inside the door. Nurses! Nurses! Rule one! You do not run, and must at all times maintain your dignity. Remember what you have just pledged. Now follow me into the classroom. Meekly, the chastened girls obeyed and listened to their first instructions. Now, you will be here at preliminary training for three months. Each week, you will have a day on the ward, which you will be assigned to after the training. You will first have to sit a small examination. The sister tutor paused and swept her steely gaze among the fidgeting girls. Some of you will not get any further than that. There was a general gasp from the now still and attentive group. Yes, I know some of you have always wanted to be nurses, some misguided idea that you will be an angel of mercy. There was a grim smile on the pinched features of the sister. Well, think again. You have three years of hard labour, sleepless nights, exhaustion and examinations, and then, and only then, you may call yourselves nurses. 
Tina stole a look at the girl standing near her. The expressions varied from defiance, sulkiness, near tears, and some like her showed a resolution to succeed. Well, I'm not giving in, she muttered. What else would I do? Teach? That was the only other alternative. Anyway, I want to travel. She had decided to join the Queen Alexandra's Royal Army Nursing Corps with a commission as soon as she was a state-registered nurse. At her grammar school, there were not many alternatives offered. Teaching and nursing were the accepted professions, unless you were bright and wealthy enough to go to university. Anyway, you were expected to get married and look after your husband and family as soon as Mr. Wright came along. Nursing was regarded as an ideal training for that. Well, not me, Tina had vowed. I want to do more with my life than that. So now you can all go over to the notice board and check which bedrooms you are sharing. But first, and again the steely gaze swept through the assembled group, a word of warning. Absolutely no men allowed in the nurse's home. There was a subdued titter from one side of the room, which abruptly stopped as sister swung to glare in that direction. You are allowed one late pass a month, otherwise you must be in by 9pm. The doors are locked at that time, and woe betide anyone who transgresses these rules. Tina made her way to the notice board, but the press was such that she held back. Time enough for that. She was not looking forward to settling into the nurse's home. What an old bag, said a husky voice behind her. That's what happens if you become a frustrated old maid, and I don't plan that for myself. A little shocked but intrigued, Tina spun round to see who had spoken, and smiled at the prettiest girl she had ever seen. Blonde curls escaped from the severe cap, and sparkling, incredibly blue eyes twinkled with mischief. The young woman who had spoken had a mature look in her eyes, and the uniform could not disguise the attractive curves. I'm looking forward to all those doctors and medical students, not to mention a few suitable male patients, she giggled. Hello, I'm Sally. Come on, let's see what ghastly roommates we've got. The group round the notice board parted, and Tina found herself looking at sheets of paper and rows and rows of names. Oh, damn, I've got to share with two others. Sally did not seem to mind what she said. Oh, I wonder if I can change. What room are you in? I like the look of you. Shall we share? Without waiting for an answer, the bouncy blonde headed for the nurse's home, dragging Tina with her. A quick dash across the freezing courtyard, where flurries of snow added to the discomfort, and they were inside the solid brick building that looked like a barracks. The corridors were painted the same green and cream, and the air was as cold as it was outside. I'm in room 24. Where are you? Uh... <laughs> I don't even know your name. The laughter was rich and infectious. Tina. Tina Anderson at your service. I'm in room 29. Tina clicked her heels and held out her hand in mock seriousness. Tina, I like you. I knew we'd get on. Well, that's on the same floor. Let's see what we can arrange. Feeling as if she'd been caught up in a whirlwind... Tina followed her new friend up an echoing stone staircase to room 29. The door was ajar and Sally pushed it open without knocking. There were already a couple of nurses sitting on two of the three beds, and judging by the expressions on their faces, they were not getting along very well. Tina's heart sank as she recognised the brown-skinned girl she had first spoken to in the chapel. Hello, girls. Look, there's been a big mistake. My friend, Tina, and I were supposed to be sharing, but there has been a bit of a botch-up. I don't suppose either of you would change, would you? The sulky, dark-haired girl exclaimed. Well, I'm not moving. I'm having this bed by the window. The other girl picked up her things and glowered at her roommate. You're welcome to her, miserable so-and-so, she turned to Sally. Which is your room? Twenty-four. I'll come and get my suitcase, and we'd better find the home sister and tell her. Tina felt embarrassed to be left with a strange girl. She noticed something different and foreign about her. There was an accent in her voice that Tina thought was Australian. Hello. Well, we'd better get to know each other. We sort of met in chapel, you might remember. 
I'm Tina. What's your name? Hine Weaver. Oh, that's a bit unusual. Uh, are you Australian by any chance? I sort of thought I heard an accent. No, I'm from New Zealand. I'm Maori. Well, part. Tina was amazed and embarrassed as Hene suddenly burst into tears. I miss my home so much. I didn't want to come here, but there was no choice. There is somewhere to live, you see. My dad is away at sea and my mum is back home and she didn't want me anyway. As if the tide had burst, she could not stop talking. We had a lovely life on the sheep station. Then it all went wrong. She found someone else. I hate her. I hate her. She sat there, thumping the bed with a fist. The bedroom door opened suddenly and Sally walked in with a bag and an expensive-looking suitcase. Well, I see you two are getting to know each other. What on earth have you done to the poor girl, Tina? Well, I think we need some refreshment to celebrate. She threw her suitcase onto the spare bed, opened it, and brought out a bottle of wine and a corkscrew. Grab the tooth mugs by the wash basin, will you, Tina? She said, as with practised ease she opened the wine. Hene had wiped her eyes and approached the other two. Touching Tina's arm, she said, I'm sorry. I'm so homesick. That's okay. I guess we all are. And a bit scared. The three young women lifted their wine-filled tooth mugs in a toast. To our future, 